uh, and then other consider other important considerations that that we that we take when, as we are um, um, as we are making um, uh, cognitive comparisons. And so that's the general layout of our of our talk today. Thanks. So what am I going to talk to about? I'm going to talk about what is cognitive functioning? What are some of the different cognitive domains that we talk about that's important? Um, I'll talk about cross-national cognitive assessment via the HCAP network. And then I want, I want to, uh, but before we do that, I want to talk about specifically what's unique about cognitive aging. And I want to talk about three general things that are uh, general features that are entire lectures, if not courses in and of themselves, but I'm going to do them insufficient justice by only spending one to two slides on each topic, largely so that you're aware of them. And we can talk in more detail as the week progresses. So what is cognitive functioning? Um, you know, when, when in, in our modern day and age, when we have a question, we ask Google, I suppose we should really ask, be asking chat GPT. Um, I should, I should have asked chat GPT, but anyway, um, Google gave a pretty decent response um, back in 2017 when I Googled this and took this uh, 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 screenshot. Um, it's your performance in mental processes such as thinking, understanding, and remembering. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good um, uh, uh, definition. It's a collection of mental processes that are controlled by the brain. Um, Oh, interesting. Um, so what are some of the cognitive domains that we that we typically talk about? Um, I think these may be some old slides, but that's okay. We'll 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 go through it. So in cognitive uh, in cognitive aging, we typically talk about domains uh, that that uh, specific domains like attention and memory, visual spatial ability. Um, and learning and reasoning. And um, uh, these different domains are distinct, but they're, but, uh, but they're also intercorrelated and related to each other. And these distinctions matter. So um, a mnemonic device that I like to use to remember the key domains of memory, attention, executive functioning, processing speed, language, and visual spatial ability. It, one mnemonic device is MELVA, if you take the first letter of each word. Another, if you rearrange the letters, is plain. So I was working in the U.S. State Department in 2005 with the, when the whole Valerie Plame incident um, was was happening, and so um, uh, that's particularly salient to me and useful. So whatever helps you understand these things. I wish I could spend time and talk about the the idiosyncrasies and interesting aspects of each of these domains, but suffice to say. Just because you have a measure of memory does not make that measure of memory the uh, uh, canonical uh, 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 great, great indicator of that domain. A measure of memory could also draw on attentional capacity. It could also draw on language ability or, or, or um, um, other, other domains. And it's, it's, a sim, it's the same thing with other, with other tests in other domains as well. Um, here's a more detailed uh, breakdown of different uh, uh, cognitive abilities. This is something called the Periodic Table of Human Abilities, published by Kevin McGrew in 2018. And so uh, this is this follows what's called the Cattell Horn Carroll um, uh, theory of uh, of cognitive domains. And I'm not going to uh, uh, explain each individual. Uh, element for you, but each of these things are thought to be different domains and different elements, such as, um, uh, uh, for example, memory is broken out into immediate memory and working memory and, and other things like that. Um, a cognitive, uh, cognitive battery that we typically administer to older adults um, in, in a lot of our gerontological surveys, including in the, in the um, across uh, different um, 
HRS partner studies like the HCAP network, we'll never administer a thorough battery of cognitive tests to get us to such narrow domains as this. Oftentimes, we, we, we're, we're, we're left with sort of these broad um, domains that, that, are, that are useful. To, to assess all of these domains in detail could take hours, if not days. It would be a lot of fun, but it would probably only be fun to a certain subset of your population. So there are lots of cognitive tests out there because there are lots of different domains and ways to organize um, human cognitive abilities. Um, I've counted at least over 500, specifically about 523 published cognitive tests in clinical and research use. Um, uh, there's always more being proposed and more being being uh, being published. It's kind of a it's kind of a growth uh, growth industry. These tests measure different domains, and as I mentioned earlier, no test is a perfect representation of one domain. Some tests are easier than others. For example, a very common uh, method for assessing memory is to give people a list of of uh, either related or unrelated nouns, some words, and ask them to repeat them. Well, we could have wordless learning tests of as a few as three words or four words and as many as 16 or 20 words and ask people to remember however many words they can. We could ask it for one uh, for just one trial or we could administer three trials of this or in the case of the auditory verbalist learning test up to seven trials. The more trials you administer, the more angry you can make your participants. So in the HCAP network, they have a, 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 a CIRAD wordless learning test that goes on for three trials. And um, that, that seems to, it seems to work. Um, different tests can be scored on, in, on entirely different units. So for those of you who are, who are interested, who are more sort of data and methodologically driven, if you're thinking about like, you know, uh, we have some people in the room who are, who are machine learning experts. Um, you can have timed tests where it's the time that it takes you to complete a task, which is important. So um, we're measuring either um, processing speed or set shifting ability, such as a trail making or a digit simple substitution test. You can also have tests that are based on counts, like the number of words you've recalled or uh, the number of animals you can recall within um, 60 seconds. Um, and, 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 and things like that. And then there are different ways of constructing measures, either as sums or as ratios of something else. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. So what's, uh, so switching gears a little bit, this is an abbreviation of a lecture that I give on cognitive aging. And so I'm cutting out some cool and exciting parts. Um, I wanna talk about three uh, things that make cognitive aging and cognition research unique from say studies of physical functioning or, um, or, or, or social functioning or other psychosocial research. I'm gonna talk about uh, a, a seminal work by uh, Maria Gleamore in 2005 and the horse racing effect. I'm gonna talk about nonlinear scaling properties that are inherent in many of our tests. And I'll, I'll talk about cognitive reserve here. So, um, so the notion of Gleamore 2005 and the horse racing effect. So the notion is in most of our gerontological studies, we start recruiting people starting at age 65. And in, if, if the study is longitudinal, we follow them forward. Now at age 65, there are cross-sectional differences in, in cognitive functioning. These cross-sectional differences didn't start at age 65. They're due to a whole lifetime of of, uh, of, of enriching activities of, uh, and such as occupation and education and going back to early life uh, opportunities. So if you're, decline, if, you're, if you're experiencing cognitive decline and uh, if that cognitive decline began before study enrollment, then baseline cognition is gonna be worse for people who are fast decliners. So um, the horse racing effect comes from a, from a paper by uh, Richard Dahl in 1981. I'll let you read this in the lower left-hand part of the screen. Um, so it's, a, it's the same effect when you have horses racing around a track. If you, if you look halfway through the race, the faster horse is further along the track and the slower horse is, is not, not quite as far along on the track. The same thing is happening here. 
this is why baseline cognition is going to be lower for people with low education, with, with, uh, for people without early life enriching experience and so on and so forth. So um, for this reason, if, if, I, if, if, if my outcome is level of cognition at a certain given time point, level of cognition, uh, the variability in the level of cognition may be due to pathological decline such as dementing process, which I'm interested in, but it might also be due to differences in early life stuff that happened 60 years ago, such as uh, uh, amount and quality of education of varying, uh, of varying durations. And so, um, you know, if, if, you're, if, if I'm looking at an exposure, whether it's air pollution or gender differences in cognitive functioning, if I'm, if I'm looking at levels of cognitive functioning, I'm kind of confounding uh, my interests, in, uh, uh, um, uh, my associations with these early life factors. And so the, the point of this is the way we get around this is by looking at longitudinal changes in cognition. Because with longitudinal change, you can at least start at say age 65 um, and, across different age, and across different age caps, just to give you a preview, uh, the, the study in the US starts at age 65, other age caps start earlier, as early as age 50, um, because, because that's what aging is considered in some of those countries. But um, uh, what am I saying here? If, uh, if, 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 we're, if, we, if we can perhaps measure decline, then that decline is thought to more closely, rep more closely um, uh, be tied with pathological impairment that's happening in, happening in older age, and it's less uh, correlated with early life factors. Another issue is nonlinear scaling properties are inherent in many tests. The notion is if you've got a test like the mini mental state examination, the MMSC, which is a test scored from zero to 30, the difference between a scoring a 29 and a 30 on the MMSC is, is, uh, is very different from scoring um, from uh, from a scoring difference of 18 to 19 on the MMSC. So different score increments mean different things depending on where you are in the um, in the score range. So what I'm showing at left here on the screen is a crosswalk between the MMSC and a cognitive factor score that we developed that we think is relatively free of of a uh, of a uh, um, uh, uh, nonlinear scaling properties. And you can see that there are irregular levels between each MMSE score and general cognitive performance. The factors that we provided to you that are that are used for the H uh, that are used in the HCAP studies for cross-national comparisons are based on uh, are based on similar methodologies to this general cognitive performance factor. So we're doing our best to try to um, uh, reduce these non-nonlinear scaling properties. Um, what are uh, in 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 your data? So, what can nonlinear scaling properties lead to? Well, if you sit back and think about it a lot, if you just model uh, 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 a test that has nonlinear scaling properties as an outcome, you may detect uh, um, quadratic effects or nonlinear shapes in your relationship. Whether that's real or whether that's a measurement phenomenon. Oftentimes, it might be a measurement phenomenon. So, yeah, that's something to be to keep in mind and be wary of. Uh, the third thing I'll talk about is cognitive reserves. So, there's this observation that among people who have similar levels of of uh, of measured brain pathology, whether you take whether you measure people's um, 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 uh, 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 the size of their brain or the, uh, or the size or capacity of their hippocampus or different other parts of their brain. There's, uh, among people with similar levels of, of brain pathology, there's variability in levels of cognitive performance. So cognitive reserve is this concept that's introduced to uh, explain this, this um, residual, this, this, um, uh, this finding of a distinction between your measured ability and your brain uh, capacity. People with more reserve are thought to be able to delay or compensate for their declines, uh, for example. Um, reserve is 
historically been measured via indices involving enriching experience such as education and occupational complexity. There are a number of problems with that uh, that, uh, that uh, um, actually Dr. Kobayashi is writing a whole grant about um, to, to rectify. Um, she, does, she does not like this third bullet, but residual measures between brain and cognitive performance uh, may be better approaches to um, assessing uh, cognitive reserve. And so for some of you, I believe some, some of you have proposed ideas around uh, reserve. And so, you know, this is something that we can delve into a little more. So let's shift gears a second time. And I'm going to talk about cross-national cognitive assessment in the HCAP network. So the Harmonized Cognitive Assessment Protocol is an NIA-funded international research collaboration that's intended to measure and understand dementia risk by collecting a common or as common as, as we could get a set of established cognitive instruments in the health and retirement study in the US and its international partner studies um, uh, uh, internationally. I'm highlighting uh, six uh, HCAPs that, that we have in the US, in Mexico, South Africa, uh, England, Charles is China and La Ciudad is in India. And in little red uh, dots I've, or, or lines, I've, I've colored in countries where HCAP, other HCAPs have been either conducted or planned or proposed. Um, uh, Dr. Brasenio mentioned that, that she's involved in, in the uh, planning of an HCAP in Nepal. There are HCAPs planned and being implemented right now in, in uh, Kenya in Malawi, possibly Cote d'Ivoire. There's data released, I believe, in for uh, Chile Cog. And uh, there are uh, HCAP, there's an HCAP in share countries in, in Europe that is uh, set to be released in, I think, about another year. And so this is a growth industry. There are probably at least a dozen other ones that, that I haven't, uh, that, that, that I'm not mentioning. And um, I always have to apologize my slide is, is a product of my uh, photoshopping skills and um, others have much better, better slides summarizing the um, international spread of the HCAP network. But the point here is that it's, 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 it's a growing network of studies that are trying to collect similar cognitive instruments and in in, similar cognitive batteries. And these batteries are taking around an hour or so to administer uh, for cognitive testing. So it's a pretty decent battery of tests. Here are some study characteristics of some of the studies. Um, uh, data collection started as early as 2015 in for the MEXCOG study. And, 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 and for the first waves of these studies, they went at least through 2019. Um, the response rates were pretty good. The age ranges, as I mentioned earlier, are 65 and above for the US and England studies, but um, the minimum age varies to some degree across different, across different countries and contexts because uh, I guess in, in many of these places, what it means to be an older adult varies as a function of where you are. Um, about half to 60% uh, of the sample is female in each of these studies. And um, the number of tests in the battery ranges from uh, 30 to, uh, to about 48 tests. Um, I, should, I should clarify, these are test items, whereas the, the original HCAP, I think, uh, uh, only had 17 tests. But one test, as, as I should have mentioned earlier, one test can yield multiple different test items. For example, a trail-making test. If you were to administer a trail-making test, well, there's a part A, and there's a part B, so that would let that would lead to two scores. There's a CIRAD wordless learning test, um, and we talked about uh, wordless learning scores. From the CIRAD wordless learning test, we can get the immediate recall. Oh, by the way, after those three immediate recall trials in about 25 minutes, we're going to ask you, please repeat those words again. So there's a delayed recall. Oh, and after that, there's a recognition. Oh, and if you really want to, you can you can calculate a learning uh, uh, score. So there's really a lot of things you could do with word with uh, wordless learning tests. That's kind of a workhorse um, uh, test. Uh, as a, this is the um, original HCAP battery as it was administered in the um, 
uh, in in the uh, HRS HCAP, and this this is a table from uh, 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 Dr. Langa's paper from I think 2020. Okay, yeah. Um, one of the key challenges is that uh, not all HCAPs administer the same items, and the goal was to to translate and to use the same tests and adapt the same um, items and tests, but. There were language and cultural and literacy and numeracy um, reasons that prevented um, uh, different H individual H caps from administering uh, uh, the, the entire battery in exactly the same fashion um, across every different country. And we can talk, that's a whole other lecture where we can talk about distinctions and deviations um, from the tests. So, um, that's why we need statistical harmonization methods for this cross-national linking. Even though by design, the HCAPs were designed to be comparable, there were some uh, small idiosyncratic differences and we, we, we don't want those differences to, uh, to be interpreted as, as cross-national differences. We wanna understand if we wanna be able to compare cognition across different countries, we wanna do it on as, 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 as common uh, uh, a scale as we can. Um, so cross-national harmonization requires common test items for linking. So we, 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 we're, we, we put on our detective hats or our hunting hats and we go hunting for common items across these different um, HCAP studies. Um, this is often, this process of what I'll call pre-statistical harmonization is often easier to do for within country, within language um, harmonization. Oftentimes you can look at the test names and you can see whether there are any ad adaptations for the tests, but um, usually usually um, we, can, we can figure out quite quickly what's, what's a common test. Um, it's a little more complicated uh, uh, when we're doing cross-national work, and um, this has been the subject of uh, Dr. Briseño's um, uh, work in the past many years. Um, so, but at the end of the day, we're going to come up with harmonized measures. What can we do with these harmonized measures of cognitive performance? Uh, and I'm talking about general cognitive performance, but also uh, cognitive performance representing specific domains that I talked about, namely executive functioning and memory and um, 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 language ability. Um, well, we can we can we can construct these composite factors that re represent our domains of interest. We can characterize mean differences between groups. We can identify predictors and outcomes using these measures. We can use the cognitive scores and dementia algorithms. We can use these cognitive scores for hackathons. Of course. So what is statistical harmonization? Well, harmonization is a broad term. It can, it can um, describe qualitative assessments of the comparability of, of, of measures. It can it incorporate aspects of study design. So the HCAP harmonized cognitive assessment protocol Harmonized and HCAP is referring to the second bullet here, where investigators came together and they 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 um, um, they uh, collaborated on 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 study design and the study measures. Um, harmonization can also refer to statistical approaches to link measurement scales or tests, and this is where I've been uh, doing doing um, um, a, lo a lot of work. Um, within the gateway to, to global aging. And this third bullet we call statistical co-calibration, just to distinguish it from other forms of harmonization. Um, so broad, some broad steps to, to harmonization include pre-statistical harmonization, which I'm not gonna talk about too much because Emily might be talking a little bit more in her next talk. Um, and then we can uh, then we do statistical harmonization approaches for test equating. We do some diagnostics that include using the derived scores in inferential models. I think by using these scores, we learn a lot more about not only the substantive areas that that we're interested in, um, but 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 we learn about aspects and qualities of the scores that 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 um, that, that may help us inform and improve the scores later on. So. When we do our pre-statistical harmonization and, and when, we, when we look for cross-country differences in tests and test items, who decides what tests, what items are in common across a study? Um, well, 
mo it, as it turns out, most but not all of the of the um, HRS studies of, or the international partner studies are tend to be led by economists and sociologists um, who employ fleets of epidemiologists and psychometricians like Dr. Meyer. Um, neuropsychologists can are, are key to helping us make these decisions. Interviewers and study team coordinators on the ground are a wealth of information to, to, to ask and talk to, as well as linguists and culturally aware investigators are very important to have on your team. Um, there are some considerations uh, that, that I won't go through in detail, but um, Dr. Brasenio up here where you see a black screen saying Kelly Liu, you can also just look at her back there as well as um, a partner in crime, Dr. Uh, Miguel Arce at Columbia has done um, a lot of work on this in this area. In terms of statistical uh, co-calibration, we use what we call an item banking approach. And um, I can, I, I would, I realize that we're, we're running sh a little short on time, but uh, broadly this involves starting with a, with a first study. For example, the HRS's HCAP, study, doing our, your pre-statistical harmonization that I totally glossed over earlier. And then at the, end of, at, at the end of the day, you end up with a harmonized set of test items between 30 and 48 test items for that study. You use item response theory, and basically you estimate an IRT model of, uh, of, of, of cognitive functioning, either for general performance or, or a domain, and you, you estimate item parameters. And then you save those item parameters into an item bank. Think about a giant Excel spreadsheet in the sky or in your computer. Um, you then take another data set, whether that's Elsa or Charles or Las Dodd. You do this, a similar pre-statistical harmonization of items that were administered in that study. You find the, the linking items that are common and as well as non-linking items. You eventually come up with a harmonized set of items. And then instead of IRT calibration, as you do in HRS HCAP, we do IRT standardization, where we, we, we estimate an IRT model, but if there are items that are in common between this other study and the first study, we fix the, the parameters for those items to be what they were earlier. And for any new items that were in this study, we add them to our item bank in our computer. At the end of the day, we can take um, uh, uh, any, 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 any further records in the data set, we can run them through our item bank. And as long as all of the indicators have parameters in, in our item bank, we can estimate latent traits and come up with a pooled data set that has equated latent trait estimates for cognitive functioning. Um, and these are the factor scores that we can use that represent general and domain specific cognitive performance. And then we can ask, did our pre once we've uh, estimate once we've uh, come up with our models, we can ask: Did the pre-statistical harmonization efforts miss anything? You know, the, uh, one of my, one of my favorite quotes is: "The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry." So, um, you know, the the, the pre-statistical harmonization relies on documentation, and documentation is only so good. So, um, essentially, we came up with the procedure that involves our neuropsychological experts rating items as, as uh, rating their, their level of confidence in, in how well these items are linking items. And then uh, we, can, we can sort of tease apart whether items are, are different or not different. And this is, this is evaluation of differential item functioning or DIF. So um, eventually in our diagnostics, we can use our scores in, in, in inferential models. So what I'm showing here are columns for studies and then rows for, for various predictors of gender, age, and education. Broadly speaking, across all of the countries, uh, 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 cognitive performance um, improves as a function of more education and, it, and it's lower as a function of, of older age, which is, which is something that you would hypothesize. Here are some histograms in data where there are columns for, for different domains from general uh, performance and memory and orientation and language and executive functioning. And there are rows for different studies. 
and most for the most part these uh, these uh, these histograms are normally distributed because we think that the latent traits are normally distributed within the populations. We'll note that for the orientation domain in the center here, you'll notice that this is not a normal distribution. There's a huge ceiling effect. This is because orientation items tend to be really easy. What year is it? 2020, thank you, Mark. It's good, <laughs> you've got it. What state are we in? That might actually trip some of us up because we travel. But um, you know, th these are fairly easy items that um, a large chunk of people are getting correct. In addition to the level of, of, uh, of cognitive performance that we can estimate um, and, and graph in histograms like this, we can also um, get at the, at, at the precision or the reliability of, of our, of our um, harmonized factors. And so for, for orientation, uh, what you can see here on the y-axis here is marginal reliability. For, for the orientation domain, and, and this is true across all the studies, um, reliability really tanks after a level of zero. And when you have low reliability, this, the, this leads to nonlinear scaling properties. And when you have low reliability, you see ceiling effects. You're pr if, if you were to use orientation and you were try to, to, were to try to model it appropriately, you probably need a quadratic term to model this weird thing here. But is it real? Probably not. It's probably because orientation items are really easy and you've got a ceiling effect. So in summary, uh, we talked about harmonization and, and why we need harmonization. We talked about cognitive um, uh, performance and cognitive testing uh, before that. And um, we talked about steps to statistical harmonization. I want to acknowledge uh, our, our, our cabal of collaborators across uh, many studies in the Gateway and the HRS network, as well as our funding. And thank you. Do we have time for questions? Okay. We'll talk throughout the week. <laughs> Yeah, yeah however it happens. I think it might be here if you press easier. Yeah. Um. There we go. Okay. All right, we're almost there. <laughs>
There we go. All right. Hopefully I'm speaking loud enough. Let me know. Somebody raise your hand if you can't hear me in the back. Um, so I'm happy to be here today to talk a little bit about um, measurement considerations um, that we should be thinking about when analyzing and interpreting cross-national HCAP data. Um, so before jumping in, just want to acknowledge um, collaborators, this is a smaller subgroup that contributed ideas for this specific presentation, um, and also several sources of funding down below. Um, so the work I'll be presenting today is really an integration of lots of different um, HCAP endeavors that I've been working on. All right, so now we're at a very exciting phase where we have publicly available cross-nationally harmonized HCAP data that we're all really looking forward to starting to work with and analyze. Um, so we think it's important for data users as you're starting to work with the data, just to be aware of some of the measurement um, assumptions that we've had to make along the way um, when generating these cross-nationally harmonized scores. Um, and it's these measurement assumptions that I'll be focusing on today uh, for this presentation. Okay. So our ultimate goal from a measurement perspective um, is to generate cognitive scores that can be um, interpreted as equivalent indicators of cognitive health across national contexts. So this is actually a pretty ambitious and lofty goal um, when thinking about cognitive aging and, and um, cognitive performance cross-culturally. So to arrive at this goal, we have to uh, meet a number of assumptions along the way throughout the research process. Um, starting with an understanding of the cognitive constructs um, that and how they operate within a particular setting, and then thinking about selecting the appropriate tests, translating and adapting those tests, collecting data, harmonizing it, and then validating the output of those data. And I'll talk about each, um, each phase along the way. So at the very beginning of the cross-cultural measurement process, um, we start with assumptions about the cognitive constructs themselves. So um, when we implement this comparable cognitive assessment battery across different national contexts, we're making assumptions about um, the phenomenology of cognitive aging across cultures, um, what cognitive skills are used and then subsequently lost with dementia. Um, and we're also making assumptions about um, you know, the way that the, the construct is measured with our tests across cultures. So we know that there's a lot of um, challenges associated with those assumptions, right? So um, to begin with, there's a very limited evidence base um, from which to base this assumption of construct equivalence across cultures um, in many countries, particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, which is one of the reasons why having access to this uh, harmonized HCAP data is so valuable um, but it also represents some challenges in that we have a limited evidence base to make assumptions about how cognitive aging operates across cultures. Then when we think about selecting tests for the HCAP, um, these decisions were made based upon the best available evidence, right, about what tests are going to be sensitive to cognitive aging. Um, but that evidence base, of course, is differentially distributed um, across the world. And so it's heavily drawing upon high income countries such as the U.S., and most of the tests in the battery um, were developed, standardized, and validated on an English-speaking U.S. dominant um, population. So those tests then need to be translated and adapted to be used in other cultural contexts. So when we think about that process of translation and adaptation, right, um, um, most of the studies have had to do that work to make it accessible, right, to their study population. Um, and when we think about that, so each individual study has specific needs um, with regard to this translation and adapt adaptation process. So linguistic diversity is one thing that really varies across countries, right? So the HRSH cap, for example, was translated from English into Spanish, so two languages total, whereas the Lacidad study, for example, had 11 different languages that had to be um, translated and, and equated. And so ultimately, you know, studies with populations that have more linguistic, cultural, and educational dissimilarity to U.S. as the source population just inherently have greater demands um, on those procedures of translation and adaptation. So this is just an example of some of the work that has to be done for the translation and adaptation process. 
Um, this is work that we're doing right now um, in the Chitwan Valley Cognitive Aging Study in Nepal. So this is an R01 led by um, Carlos Mendes de Leon at Georgetown University and Diego Gamire at University of Michigan. And so we have a, a pretty comprehensive approach to our adaptation process um, because we've learned that there's a very limited evidence base, um, both with regard to cognitive assessment in Nepal and also with regard to cognitive aging and dementia. And so what we've done is um, we've assembled a team of local Nepali collaborators with both clinical and also um, research expertise um, in the areas of cognitive aging and dementia and working with older adults. And we're doing the best we can to collaborate with them as closely as possible, getting their feedback on the translation. Then um, you know, we'll ultimately plan to do some qualitative cognitive interviewing with local older adults to get a sense of whether our items are familiar and understandable um, and operating the way that we hope that they will. We'll have to do you know, this iterative process, repeating with focus group, doing more pre-testing work, doing preliminary clinical validation until ultimately we, we feel that it's ready. So you can see that this is a very time-consuming, it's resource-heavy process. And studies may vary with regard to how much time and how feasible it is um, to do um, a rigorous approach um, here. And so just to share a few examples of the challenges associated with the translation adaptation process. So these are examples of um, feedback that we've gotten from our focus group um, with regard to items that were in the HCAP battery. So just, just to take an example of, of, of one of these, so the question about what do people usually use to cut paper, right? Our local um, expert team shared that in this community, older adults might not be familiar with scissors or paper, right? So this is intended to be a very simple language item where most people are able to answer it without any um, difficulty at all. So we know that this needs um, to be modified, right? So what we have to do as a multidisciplinary team is to go back to the original item, really think about what's the construct that we're trying to measure with that item and how difficult is it in the original source population. Then we go back to our multidisciplinary team and we think about, well, what's another item that's gonna measure that same construct with a similar degree of difficulty and is as universally familiar in that context as scissors and paper is in the US. So you can see it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult endeavor and it requires a multidisciplinary expertise, both in the construct and also in the local context. And we do the best that we can to make these decisions and then pre-test them, um, but we simply are operating with a very limited evidence base compared to you know, what exists in countries like the US. So ultimately, when we think about this process of translating and adapting our tests, um, there's this inherent um, uh, differential distribution of risk for measurement bias, right? Where in countries where we have more linguistic, cultural, and educational dissimilarity to the U.S. as a source population, there's just inherently more vulnerability to measurement bias associated with all of the demands of translating and adapting and pretesting and validating. So then moving on to data collection procedures, right? So when we're harmonizing cognitive data across studies, we have to make the assumption that overall in general, the approaches to data collection are comparable and any differences wouldn't affect how we'd interpret a test score. Um, but we know that there's a lot of challenges with this assumption, right? When just inherent to collecting cognitive data in different settings around the world. Um, so there may, may be differences in how the data are captured, right? Um, what are the procedures for training interviewers and the demands on training interviewers, particularly in multilingual contexts? How is quality control managed? So having access to things like audio recording and centralized versus individual interviewer scoring, all of these things um, can impact um, the, the, the data. There are also population level differences that impact data collection. So things like um, we know that there is differential distribution of uncorrected vision and hearing impairment, and those have implications for how we um, assess cognition. And so the demands on that um, differ across studies. Selecting the optimal assessment language, right? And in, in primarily monolingual countries, this isn't much of a consideration at all. Um, but in countries where there's a high prevalence of multilingualism, 
this is a factor that impacts how the data are collected and it could potentially impact um, test scores because we know that being tested in one's non-dominant language disadvantages cognitive test performance. And then finally, in terms of the testing environment, most of the HCAPs are collected in people's homes. And we know that home environments um, differ across contexts, right? So there may be different demands placed on study teams um, to manage the testing environment um, for it to be as optimal as possible. So this is just an example of um, how testing environments might differ across uh, different settings. This is a photo I took um, in Nepal in Chitwan Valley when we were collecting some pilot data. So this particular respondent preferred that the assessment happen outside. And so during the course of the interview, we had pedestrians passing by who wanted to stop by and observe. We had you know, a vehicle passing by like with a megaphone advertising things for sale. Um, of course, lots of vehicles and road noise. And, um, and so it, was, it, it, it created different demands for the respondent, right? And in performing a cognitively demanding task, that person had to inhibit a lot of visual and auditory distractions. And so it just creates a different setting um, for the assessment compared to somebody that might be tested in a quiet indoor setting with, without, access, or without distractions. Okay, so by the time we get to data harmonization, um, all of the assumptions um, of measurement or, or the data harmonization work is really predicated on all of these assumptions that I've talked through, right? So as Alden mentioned, um, this statistical co-calibration approach that we use for the HCAP is based on this confirmatory factor analysis approach. And it allows for some items to be um, comparable or the same across studies and some items to be unique. So we do have some flexibility um, in identifying which items are, um, are, you know, we think are different across studies, but it does require us to make decisions and feel confident that we are measuring some of these items in the same way with the same construct and, and you know, essentially free from bias across studies. So what we've done to try to account for as many of these potential measurement differences as possible is this pre-statistical harmonization approach, uh, which Dr. Gross mentioned a bit um, in the previous talk. But essentially um, what we're looking for is any factors um, that we can identify based on what we have available to us, the documentation, access to study teams, et cetera, um, that could impact a cognitive test score that's not related to that underlying cognitive construct that we want to measure. And so as Dr. Gross mentioned, we look at the procedural details, we look at how the test was adapted, how the test was translated, et cetera. And then we make graded decisions on how confident we are um, that those items are equivalent. Um, so some assumptions we make with this process, right, is, is first that this procedure can identify items that are free from bias across studies. Um, and we also make the assumptions that our statistical procedures, those diff detection procedures, can confirm and account for these non-equivalent items. Um, but some of the challenges here, right, is that, first of all, with our pre-statistical harmonization decisions, those are based on documentation that's available, and it's also based on the available evidence base, right, about um, how, how confident can we be that, that two items are, are administered the same and in, in, in measuring the same construct. And when we're doing that with an unequal or a non-equivalent evidence base to draw from, um, those decisions become a, a bit more tenuous. And then when we use our diff detection methods, the, the assumption there is that most of the items do not have bias and we're detecting the items um, that behave differently from the other items. Um, and so if there's pervasive bias that affects all the items in a similar way, in the same similar magnitude, um, we won't be able to detect that with our, uh, with our diff detection tools. So zooming out a bit and looking at the harmonized scores, um, we have a lot of good news, right? So we have been able to psychometrically um, link our, our test scores across studies. And, um, you know, um, it, it, it's looking quite good overall. Um, but it's also, I think, important to note that we have linked our scores, but we haven't yet achieved measurement equivalence. So this is just an example of a, uh, paper we actually just got accepted this morning, so it can be impressed now. <laughs> Very fun. 
Um, so as you can see in this figure here, right, when we plot the reliability between HRS HCAP and MEXCOG, um, we showed differences in reliability, particularly at the lower end of the ability range. Um, so again, this, the scores are linked, um, but they, we haven't yet achieved um, equivalence in measurement precision. Okay. So again, thinking about when we're using the data um, and performing our analyses, um, it's just important to remember that we do have the best available scores that we've been able to create. Um, and we've done our best to account for and adjust for every possible um, uh, difference in measurement that we can, but it's just not possible to address and remove all possible sources of measurement differences um, across studies. And so um, when we're looking at country level differences, there's still we still have that risk for confounding by measurement differences. So it's important to, to consider that when we're interpreting the data. Another important consideration is thinking about the classification of cognitive impairment. Um, so, you know, the goal of classifying cognitive impairment, right, is identifying who is not cognitively healthy, who has had something happen to their brain um, uh, where, they're, where they're no longer uh, as cognitively healthy as they were earlier in life, right? And so this is really uh, a decision that has to be made with, uh, with reference to a local robust normative sample. We want to know how is this score operating within its own context. And so just to briefly review what a local robust normative sample is, um, it's where we select the subgroup within a study that we think we feel most confident that they're most likely to be cognitively healthy. So that means we, we feel confident, as confident as possible that, um, that their brains are, um, are healthy. So examples of things that we would select out of a, of a robust normative sample, people who have a self-reported history of dementia, stroke, traumatic brain injury, um, who have subsequent uh, cognitive decline or mortality if we have access to follow-up data, those types of things. We then perform um, demographic adjustments that are relevant for that particular local context. Um, we determine cut scores, and then we apply that to the full sample. And in that way, we're able to understand whether these, um, this cognitive performance, these cognitive test scores are normal or not within that particular local context. So then finally, I think another um, exciting implication of all of these uh, measurement considerations is the needs um, on um, generating evidence of construct validity. And so this can be a great opportunity for data users to think about how can we show um, with, uh, with empirical evidence that our cognitive test scores are measuring cognition in an equivalent way across these national contexts. And this involves building um, what we call a nomological network of evidence, where we use multiple sources of, um, of data and multiple, multiple methodologies to identify and show evidence that we have um, a construct that we're measuring in the same way across countries. These are just a few examples. All of them are limited uh, is, is evidence on their own, but when, when put together and, and generated within a network, then we can start to show uh, measurement consistency across countries. And then we can take what we learn from this validation work and continue to improve um, our measurement of cognition. Um, I'll breeze past this one, but just to think, just to keep in mind that these measurement considerations apply really to all sorts of um, cross-national data that we're, that we're thinking about. So this is just an example between um, um, HRSH CAP and MEXCOG, where, let's see if I could get this to go. Um, we saw differences in um, how, and the endorsement of self-rated memory concerns across countries. Um, but when we look closely, we can see that there's some differences in um, how that actual item is translated across countries, and it means something a little bit different when the translation happens. So these are things we can think about when we're comparing um, even other sources of data uh, across countries. All right, any questions? Uh, there are two questions from the webinar. Okay. First question, did you mention who is the PI of the Nepal Cognitive Assessment Protocol? Yes, uh, co-PIs, um, Carlos Mendez de Leon at Georgetown University and Dirga Gamire at University of Michigan. You can put that in the chat if that would help. Sure. Okay, it's not working for me. Okay. 
Okay, I'll come back to you. Um, second question. It is very odd when investigators from high income countries who call into studies on low income studies when they have not even lived in that context or even can speak or understand the language. Almost seems a colonial way of research. Is there any other better way to conduct um, equitable inclusive research? I love that question. Um, I think that's a really important question, something I think about a lot. Um, and it, it, it goes to that, just, you know, the inherent differences um, in, um, in doing this research. And so for me, I, I think it's really important to um, include local collaborators along the way as much as possible and make sure that we have partnerships um, so that we can learn about the context. Because I, with, for example, in the Nepal study, right, like uh, I need those local collaborators. I bring expertise in cognition and they bring expertise in all of the local contacts. And it's just impossible to do the work without those partnerships. Um, so it's a, it's a very important question. Okay. Oh. Thank you um, for that great point, Jenko. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to take another step beyond what Drs. Gross and Briseño just presented to you, thinking about both the data collection and pre-statistical harmonization side, followed by the statistical harmonization or co-calibration. And I want us to move from that and start thinking about, okay, now what do we actually do now that we have the data in hand? Now we have statistically co-calibrated cognitive function factor scores or you know, domain specific factor scores as well. We also have a wealth of survey data from all of these different studies or countries that we're interested in doing work on. How do we actually analyze these data? And I come at this from the perspective of thinking about kind of what are appropriate both appropriate techniques both in terms of methodological and statistical rigor but also just being really thoughtful about taking data from several different very diverse countries around the world and of course as individual researchers we can't have um, we, well, we can't easily have familiarity and experience and living in and having first-hand experiences in all of the different countries that we may wish want we, that we may wish to compare when doing a cross country comparison. And also for that reason, I love that second question um, that was asked to Dr. Brasenio because this is something that I also think about a lot. It's really closely tied to decolonization of the global health research movement. And I think that it's really important for all of us, regardless of our backgrounds or where, from, or where we are from, to think really, really carefully about how to use the data, um, both theoretically and methodologically. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. The motivation for thinking about this should be like really obvious to all of us in the room, right? So the HCAP data are a huge opportunity for thinking about um, better understanding the global burden of dementia and kind of what are differences and similarities and risk and protective factors for later life cognitive outcomes around the world. And thinking of other creative, you know, research questions that I probably haven't even thought of and won't mention here. Right, and with these statistically harmonized or co-calibrated scores that Dr. Gross spoke about, like this is really possible, right? But I think there's a lot of temptations of you know different types of comparisons that we may wish to make with the co-calibrated scores. And I think as Dr. Brasenio mentioned, like these aren't as, it's not as easy to harmonize these as it might seem at face value. And just because you have a general cognition factor or a memory factor doesn't necessarily mean that these are identical constructs, even though we've managed to link the scale. So I want us to talk a little bit more about that in depth. And what I'm going to present now is sort of a rough guideline or outline for the different types of analyses that you may wish to do today for those groups that are doing cross-country comparisons. 
not all of you are doing cross country comparisons and that's fine. If you know your, your work group is going to do a single country alone, you can probably ignore a lot of what I'm going to say, although there are some good general methodological practices here. But if your group is doing a cross country comparison, this is a rough framework for kind of decision points or questions to ask yourself to help guide your analysis. And specifically what I'm going to be talking about here are analyses focused on comparing risk factor associations across countries, right? So you have your X variable, you have your Y variable, which is a cognitive variable, and you're going to compare that X, Y exposure outcome relationship across several different data sets or countries, right? So an example question could be, how does the association between education and cognitive function vary cross-nationally? Just a very basic um, motivating example here that I'm going to show, um, I'm going to talk you through as we talk through the principles. So there's four basic steps. Each of these has a lot more um, detail and there's a whole kind of theoretical piece um, that I've left out for now because I think Dr. Basenio spoke a lot about it already, but I do have a table at the end that outlines some of the theoretical questions that I think people um, could ask themselves and I'm also happy to sit down with groups and talk it through in a lot more detail. So first, so we spent a lot of time talking about harmonization of cognition data, right? But when we actually sit down and want to do data analysis, that's not the only variable that needs to be harmonized, right? Like we want to think about, can our exposure variable be harmonized, both from a theoretical perspective? Is our exposure of interest really the same construct across contexts? And from a data perspective, is it measured in the same way? Can we actually harmonize this variable? Um, and then two, ensure that data on your desired model covariates are also harmonizable, right? Because you're probably gonna have a set of confounders that you may wish to adjust for, and you'll, you're gonna wanna harmonize those data as well. Choose the most appropriate modeling strategy. There's a couple of decision points here, and we'll get into that, and then how, decide how to handle age cap sampling weights. So our worked example, well, how does the association between education and later life cognitive function vary cross-nationally? So first, ensuring that the exposure variable can be harmonized. So like I said earlier, this is not just a data issue. This has important theoretical implications as well with respect to understanding the nature of the construct that you're trying to measure across countries, right? So when thinking about education, we often measure this as the amount of education that one has attained, right? And that's often coded in terms of years of education or a degree level, like high school, college, et cetera, right? And now, that's just actually a really crude measure. And when thinking about different countries around the world, and this also absolutely varies within countries as well on kind of regional scales, um, there are a lot of really big differences in terms of like what education means, what a variable representing educational attainment means, right? Education is a social institution. There are wide variations in terms of how educational systems function. What is the quality of education? What is the content of the curriculum of education? How many days per school year um, are students in school? What is the What are the credentials of teachers? What is the level of funding of different schools? And of course, these are things that vary between countries. They also vary within countries. Um, differences within countries are kind of harder to address um, with the types of data that we have when we are working with the HRS International Partner Studies, but it's really important just to consider that educational attainment in terms of years of education or degree level may not be representing the same thing. And so what we can, we've sort of have done in this motivating example, the best approach possible, which is we used the international standard classification of education to crosswalk educational attainment variables from um, several different countries um, to get them on the same scale. And this is kind of a figure of the heuristic for the ISCED crosswalk. And this was actually really challenging. I know that the gateway to global aging data also uses ESCED to crosswalk education. Um, we sort of redid it ourselves because we found that at, when you harmonize data, and I'm not talking about statistical harmonization or co-calibration, you're sort of limited to going to the lowest common denominator, right? Like which variable is measured with the most coarseness and you sort of have to bring everything down to that level of coarseness, um, which is really, really challenging because you, here we're losing information, we're bringing about opportunity for misclassification bias, for uncontrolled confounding, we often don't wanna do that. 
So um, as part of the, pro the grant that Alden and I are leading, we reharmonized education to get finer categories according to the ISCED, but we found that we ultimately had a lot of distributional problems, which I'll talk about in the coming slide, right? So while there is a harmonized variable for education available on the gateway to global aging, you'll find, and I'm sure like your team has so much experience with this, Jen Cook and analysts here, like you're often kind of bringing things down to the lowest common denominator, which is a major, that's just a challenge inherent to data harmonization, but I will say there are harmonized data for many exposures available on the gateway. So when we see, when we um, kind of standardize things according to the ISCED, and here we also, we, we cap things at any college at the highest level, just because we were starting to get very, very small numbers going above this, especially in some of the middle income countries. Um, we see that there's distributional problems, not only at the bottom end of the distribution, so this is HRSH cap is the United States, ELSA H cap is England, there's very, very few people who have no education or early childhood education, and then on the flip side, like I said, there are relatively few people in Mexico, India, or China that have any level of college, but we also see some distributional problems in the middle of the distribution so lower secondary and upper secondary we have very few people here in mexico with upper secondary few people with lower secondary and elsa age cap and this is often just a function of the way that the data are collected and coded in terms of the highest level of education and the kind of the degree of like fineness to which we can harmonize um, according to this crosswalk so we end up collapsing to secondary only um, so this is so kind of distributional problems are often going to be a challenge when you are harmonizing data. So if you've decided like, yes, I have this exposure variable, yes, we sort of think it means this, the same thing, or we think it actually doesn't mean the same thing across all cons across all contexts. And that's why we want to do the, um, that's why we want to do this cross-national comparison because we want to show how it might operate differently. And we think that we might have different point estimates because we're actually measuring something different. Um, that's kind of relates to the idea of the consistency assumption in epidemiology, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but where was I going with this? Yes, you're just going to run into distributional problems and you're just going to have to think really carefully about kind of maintaining cell sizes, but also maintaining um, kind of having a meaningful variable that captures the information with the level of detail that you want to have. So I'm kind of anticipating that several groups might have a little bit of time up front just with respect to data management and thinking about how to code and classify your variables. So be ready for that. Um, ensuring your model covariate data are available across countries. This is that same principle, right? So thinking about education and cognition, this is a simplified DAG. I know I'm missing an arrow from this to that. It just didn't fit nicely. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different early life confounders of the relationship between educational attainment and cognition, right? Some of them are measured, some of them are unmeasured. Um, and you're going to want to maybe think about whether or not, first of all, are those data available in all of the countries that you want? And you also might want to think about, is the confounding structure the same across all of the different populations or countries that you're studying, right? Like you might really have differing confounding structures. So in certain contexts, there might be greater early life barriers to achieving education than in other contexts. So I think like the parameters, if you were to build this model out, might look different um, across countries, and that's fine. And there's ways to handle that. We can talk about it. But like the actual confounders might differ. So I would recommend drawing a DAG or a directed acyclic graph, mapping out your exposure, your outcome, and what do you think your confounders, and consider whether that DAG differs across countries? Like, should you really think about a country-specific DAG? And are your covariates that's going to be the same? And then choose your modeling strategy. This is a little bit more complicated. I, From my perspective, I really think there's two options here. You can do a pooled analysis or a parallel analysis. Some people call a parallel analysis a coordinated analysis. And what I essentially mean is, for a pooled analysis, are you going to pool all of your data into a single data set, run a single model, perhaps with an indicator variable for country? Or are you going to keep your data stratified by country and run a series of country specific models? Right. And so that will be sort of informed by your theoretical approach to the research question. Right. Um, a parallel, I would do, I would recommend a parallel, sorry, a pooled analysis if you really think that you have, that you're measuring the same thing across all countries and you 
really kind of expect to see a similar point estimate across countries. You can sort of think of this as analogous to conducting a meta-analysis, right? Are you going to do a random effects or a fixed effects meta-analysis? Do you think there's heterogeneous effects across countries, or do you think you've got kind of like one single point estimate that should be reflecting the same association across all countries? If that's not the case, I would recommend doing a parallel analysis. Um, and then you can sort of qualitatively compare your associational point estimates across countries. There's also been other benefits in terms of flexibility to doing a parallel analysis. You can have different covariate sets across your models. So if you really think there are different confounding structures across populations or across countries, you can handle that by doing a parallel analysis. I think a really good example here is how to handle a variable for race and ethnicity as a confounder, right? So that is a really relevant construct in the United States. There's a really kind of US census defined set of classifications of race, race and ethnicity. The, in the UK and England, it's similar. There are black and ethnic minority groups that are recognized by the government. But And I think every country has concepts around a race and ethnicity, but they're not the same thing in terms of the process of racialization that minoritizes people and in terms of the types of racism or types of minoritization and discrimination um, that people face in different settings, right? So in India, there's the caste system, for example. In Mexico, there's a very, very small percentage of indigenous um, people of Mexico that are not terribly well represented in MHAS, um, but there are really big differences in terms of living standards, for example, by urban and rural living status. And these are all kind of different concepts and variables that might be getting at the same thing. How would we adjust for that in a, in a model that is pooled using all um, data sets together? And again, you run into that problem of sort of coarsening down to the lowest common denominator. And we can talk more about worth in our working groups kind of theoretically and methodologically about how we want to handle um, kind of important confounding variables like that that don't necessarily have um, like you know the same kind of construct or concept across countries. But of course in a parallel analysis we do have the potential loss of comparability if we're kind of tailoring our models quite a bit to be very different across countries. The slide shows a set of coefficient plots for that education cognition example that I showed you. These were run by Yuan Zhang, who is a collaborator on our grant, who's faculty at Columbia. And this was a parallel analysis. So we really thought that education meant something different in different countries. That was kind of the a priori hypothesis. Education as a social institution might be doing different things for cognition in different places around the world. So we have HRS HCAP in the US, ELSA HCAP in England. MexCog in Mexico, Lossidad in India, and Charles H. Cap in China here. The reference, this is just a really straightforward linear regression model, and we've adjusted for age and then minority slash urban rural status. I can talk more about that. We did try to harmonize that um, kind of variable representing minority status to be similar across countries, parental education, and height as a marker of net nutrition in early childhood. The um, y-axis shows the um, kind of the score for the general cognitive factor. So it has a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one in the HRS HCAP. And then that's the distribution is standardized to that of the HRS HCAP across all of the countries so that they're on a common scale. That's that statistically co-calibrated factor score that Alden Gross spoke about. And then the reference category is um, primary education, just because it was the largest sample size in all countries. So I think the first kind of take home from this slide is that we see positive gradients in cognition according to education across contexts, right? Like that's a good thing, I think. I mean, it, it means either education is like really conferring cognitive benefits for people later in life, or people with education are just better at taking tests. It's really kind of, that's kind of like the million dollar question, right? That's something to disentangle. Um, but there really are some differences, like in HRS HCAP and ELSA HCAP, the estimates for none or early childhood education are essentially meaningless because the sample size is so small. And we see kind of like, you know, a, really a distinction between secondary education and any college. And it's actually, any college looks like it's providing slightly, slightly stronger positive effects for men, even though it's not statistically significant. Well, when we look at these middle income countries, we see there's a really big jump between having none or early childhood education. And a lot of this really was like no formal education um, in these three countries and primary education, which is the null. So I think this um, slide here really kind of highlights the importance of early childhood education in middle income countries. And especially so for women um, in 
Charles H. Cap, for example. And then again, we do see benefits of kind of later college education and especially so for women, whether that is an issue of like differential selection into higher education for women in middle income con countries where the barriers to entering higher education for women are higher or like really some kind of gender specific effect um, is unclear, but I think there's a lot to unpack here. And it's, it's just really interesting to be able to see these gradients when we know that we have kind of a common standardized scale for the outcome variable and then to think really critically about the different kind of you know forms of um, like real causal association or selection mechanisms that might be explaining them. And again, this was a parallel analysis where we had separate models for each country. So that's what we did here. A pooled analysis is an alternative approach um, with considerations that I mentioned earlier, but then you might also want to think about, are we going to have fixed effects or random effects per country, right? So a fixed effect would just be you're doing like a linear regression model and adjusting a dummy indicator for country, right? And this would control out any country level differences. So if you really think there's kind of like one true association that you're estimating across countries and you just wanna even out any differences by country, just control for it. I'm not sure that I recommend that, to be honest. Um, I think that's just there's just too many strict assumptions there. Um, if you interact your exposure variable by country, of course, then you can investigate effect modification by country. I would also like if you do take this approach, I would also recommend interacting uh, key covariates against country to allow covariates to have different associations with your outcome by country if you have statistical power to do so. And really kind of intriguing alternative would be to have random effects. Um, so do a multi-level model whereby you can allow like for clustering of outcomes at the country level and possibly partition variance in cognition to differences between people, differences between countries. We can't really do this yet with the number of age caps that have been administered. The sample size at the group level, the country level is just too small. I think it's possible if you have subnational data. So for example, in India, we have state, um, but we don't have subnational data on every single country. But I think if you do have subnational data, I think this is a nice idea. If you have a good research question that really kind of motivates and justifies the use of a multi-level model for partitioning of variance. Um, and then one other thing to think about, if you do a, if you do, do a pooled analysis and if you do choose fixed effects for country, just be really sure that you're comparing apples to apples. This comes back to the consistency thing that I mentioned earlier, right? So think about the consistency assumption and causal inference. Um, and so this is the idea that the exposure variable as measured across all countries is truly measuring the same construct. So a really good way to test, like if you are really confident that you are like, you know, estimating a single point estimate, it's the same exposure across countries. Just think like for those individuals that are unexposed with an example, let's say a binary, I don't know, a binary exposure. If you were to hypothetically intervene and set your exposure variable X to equal one for those who are not exposed and then observe the probability of the outcome Y, is that probability of the outcome Y going to equal the same probability of the outcome Y for those individuals in your study who actually have an X of one, right? So there's one flavor of the exposure. And if you were to hypothetically intervene on the exposure to change it, are you going to see the same outcome that you observe in people who are already exposed, right? So there are no kind of, there is like one flavor of the exposure that is one effect um, on uh, changing the probability of the outcome. And I'll refer you to a paper here if you wanna read a little bit more about the consistency assumption to help guide your decision making. Okay, how to handle HCAP sampling weights. I think we, in most cases, recommend the use of HCAP sampling weights. Not all HCAPs sampled in the same way from their parent surveys. Some are a random sample like the HRS, but some were stratified based to get an even distribution of different levels of cognitive status across their samples. And you'll, you're gonna wanna wait back to the main sample to account for that sampling. If you do a parallel analysis, it's pretty straightforward. You can just provide, you can just use the weights as provided. Um, if you're using separate models, just be really kind of cognizant about what those weights are doing. If you do a pooled analysis, you're going to have an extra step in terms of harmonizing your weights um, to facilitate their pooled use in your analysis. And the reason is because the HCAP sampling weights were calculated using different methodologies in each country and are standardized in different ways across HCAPs, right? So some are standardized and some are not standardized as provided in the publicly, public use data. Um, here's what the provided sampling weights look like, at least in a, a, the data releases from last fall. I don't know if any weights have been updated since last fall. Um, but for example, you can see the Lossy Dodd weights and the ELSA H cap weights have been standardized to have a mean of one, and they sum to this total sample size of their H cap samples. Um, whereas the HRS H cap and MEXCOG 
and Halsey HCAP are not, right? I'm actually not entirely sure exactly how Halsey HCAP sampled or curated their sampling weights, but these ones are particularly important to use because I know that Halsey HCAP sampled to get an even distribution of individuals in their HCAP with normal cognition, MCI, and dementia. So you can't combine these weights at face value, otherwise you're gonna get some weird results. Um, so there's a few different approaches to handling sampling weights or to harmonizing sampling weights. And I think the choice, the best choice depends on the purpose of your analysis. So the first approach would be to use unstandardized weights that sum to the sample size of the underlying population that the parent study is trying to generalize to. Um, this works if you're really trying to make kind of like, you know, inferences about prevalence. Um, I'm not going to say incidence because we're not working with longitudinal data here, but if you really want country level estimates thinking about descriptive epi statistics or prevalence, this makes sense. Um, but I would also warn you that if you're not trying to do that, countries with very large populations like India are going to overwhelm um, your point estimates in any pooled analysis. The other approach would be to standardize your weights so that each HCAP sample is weighted equally in analysis. So the sum of your sampling weights is going to be equal to some arbitrary constant that's the same across studies. Not ideal, like it's an option, but I would probably don't do it because we actually do think that it's a, like we do want our precision to be related to the actual sample size. So we don't want to upweight studies with smaller samples and downweight studies with larger samples. And then option three is to standardize your weights so, the so that the contribution of each HCAP is proportionate to its sample size. So we're going to respect the differences in sample size, um, but we're not going to have like differences in sample size that are so big as like the differences between general populations that certain HCAP studies are going to overwhelm others in analysis. And I think this third approach is probably going to be sufficient for most analyses. Um, and I just wanted to leave us with a brief word about the direct comparisons of means as well as distributions of cognitive outcomes. So if you'll recall from Dr. Gross's talk, he showed that slide with all of the histograms of the distributions of the general cognition um, factor score, memory, language, et cetera. You saw they were largely normally distributed, but there were coming back to thinking about the general cognition factor, especially there were some pretty big differences in the means and the locations um, of those distributions, right? And so you'll see this in the data. If you sit down and you start working with the cognitive function scores across countries, the mean levels are higher in higher income countries and they're lower in the middle income and low countries, right? And Dr. Basenio also alluded to that as well. So I think it's really important to be really thoughtful about why we think this is happening, especially as many of us are researchers from the global north, um, from country, like, you know, from higher income countries, and we want to be really thoughtful and responsible about our use of the data and how we interpret um, differences that are, we are inevitably going to see across countries, right? And my recommendation is to approach direct comparisons of means, standard deviations, distributions, like really with a lot of caution across countries. One, if not only for all of these measurement, um, you know, measurement challenges and issues that Dr. Basenio talked about, I think even with our statistical calibration approach that Dr. Gross spoke about, there still can really be unknown unknowns in terms of the way in which people are responding to all of the different types of cognitive test items. And like the most pessimistic view that you can take is that people in high income, high income English speaking countries are just simply better at taking the types of tests that are in the HCAP battery than people in lower income countries where it has been, where the HCAP battery has been um, translated into different languages, adapted for cultural relevance, like there might be still things missing in terms of performance, right? And I think that to throw, to say that is definitely the case and throw all the data, I think would be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But I do think we do need to be really thoughtful about that um, potential source of bias. There might still be unknowns. There's, there are some assumptions of the, the statistical co-calibration that are untestable, that we can't ever really know. And I think given, I know in this room, we all come from different places and have different backgrounds, but I do think that, you know, if you're from an English speaking country, or if you are from a high income country and you don't have experience in a lot of the places where these tests have been adapted, there really might be unknown things in terms of how well they're performing. And we just wanna be really careful about that. Um, and so, yeah, there are many possible interpretations for country level differences in mean scores. I think attributing them to inherent differences between people or between places as something like innate um, is a mistake. Um, I think a lot, a lot of this is really modifiable. And I think because we do have these co-calibrated scores, it might be tempting to do so. And I think we just want to not do that. And I sort of think that 
any differences that we're seeing in the means and distributions probably reflect not only some residual me measurement differences, but also like really kind of differences between populations and sort of that totality of life course risk and protective factors that people are experiencing that are really contextually shaped um, and hopefully modifiable ultimately like that's something we want to achieve in the end right so like let's my my sentiment here is just be really cautious and thoughtful when kind of directly comparison comparing means and i think comparing risk factor associations might be a little bit um, more fruitful that's all i have to say this table shows this kind of full set of best practices that we have come up with as a group. They are split into theoretical and methodological considerations and they're posed as a set of questions um, under each heading that you may wish to ask yourself when you're setting up your research question and your data analysis. I think these slides will be distributed, so I hope you'll all have access to them. I mean, if there's pieces here that are not interesting or useful to you, ignore it. Um, this is meant to kind of be helpful as a guiding framework and I hope it is and I'm happy to speak through any of it um, with you in the coming days. That's all. I just want to thank my really fantastic uh, collaborators, the Gateway, HCAP, and the NIA. That's a good question. So we have two waves of data um, with the HRS HCAP. There are other HCAPs that have longitudinal data either in the field or ongoing. I know ELSA HCAP in England is quite far along with this. Um, so basically this is something that Alden and I have been talking about a lot because in the renewal of our harmonization R01, pulling in the longitudinal HCAP data and thinking about test effects is kind of one of our key analytic aims. I think it's really challenging because we only have two waves of data. Um, but I think that we can do our best to get a handle on it. And the other thing is that different studies are going to be, different age caps are going to be done in different parent studies where the participants have differing degrees of prior cognitive testing history prior to entering the age cap, right? So the HRS has been going on since the 90s. And so that's a population with kind of a really strong prior testing experience. Obviously, the HCAP is a lot more in depth, but those are other things we're going to want to think about as well, whereas some of the newer studies, the HCAP will be one of the first times they've been a cognitive test. Um, so I don't have an answer for you yet, but we're working on it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is super thoughtful. I really appreciate you, uh, the part of explaining uh, full analysis and parallel analysis. Um, I'm not working on different countries, um, but I was wondering if, if we can take these thoughts and these, um, these outlines mm -hmm. of how we make, how we study effects or associations for a very heterogeneous group, mm -hmm. to the idea of, for example, if we were looking, looking at one same country and mm -hmm. education, let's mm -hmm. say, but um thinking about the best parallel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by sex or yeah like yeah i think you mean like do we include an interaction term mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or do a super analysis yeah like, um bring these thoughts to yeah also looking at yeah Yes, I think we largely can. Like my sort of feeling is country as a variable, it's an effect modifier in a way, right? I think that, you know, populations of countries are different because like there's a lot of really macro, like political, economic and social structures that people operate in that vary across countries. And so I think within populations, I mean, obviously like the United States, for example, there's tons of heterogeneity within the US population. And I think having a really good motivated research question for why you would want to stratify into subpopulations, you could take the same approach. And your question as you were talking also made me think of a really great paper by Nancy Krieger that came out, I don't know, maybe like 10, 10 years ago, I don't know. It's called Who and What is a Population? And it's just this really fantastic sort of theoretical piece on how we define populations, right? And it's almost arbitrary in terms of how we define our a population you can zoom out you can scale and you can cleave a population geographic boundaries are like political and changing right so i think it does start to get really messy when you start to think of it that way take a look at that paper it's really it's really a good kind of thought exercise it's published in millbank quarterly i think 2012 but i could be wrong um but yeah i think that these principles apply anytime you want to do a stratified analysis whether it's like subnational or cross-country
Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. So I'll be talking a bit about causality. So many uh, scientific uh, questions and policy uh, questions that we ask ourselves are, are essentially causal questions. And I give some examples here, like does Medicare save lives? So the idea is that like if it weren't for Medicare, some people would die earlier. Um, what is the effect of education on dementia? Uh, what's the effect of low birth weight on later life health? Does money make you happy? These are uh, questions that uh, assume that something causes something else. And uh, answering causal questions is often difficult. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, not all questions and not all interesting questions even are uh, causal questions. Um, so, for example, how many people are unhappy? That's not a causal question. Uh, are people who live in poverty less happy than people who don't? Uh, that in itself is not a causal uh, question. Uh, what is the correlation between income and health? What is the probability that Trump will win the next uh, presidential election? Uh, or what's the prevalence of dementia among individuals without education? And what's the prevalence of dementia among individuals with a college education. However, when you look at this, you will notice that some of these like immediately will draw you into a causal like thinking. So some, some of these, although the question itself, especially the last one, for example, the question itself is not a causal question. It, it immediately may lead to speculation about uh, causality. Um, so, let me talk a little bit about theoretical frameworks for how to think about uh, causality. And, and uh, the first one is the, is the Rubin uh, causal model, which is very popular in economics and statistics. And this model is uh, the most natural for, for questions that uh, can be viewed as the effect of a binary treatment. And I put treatment between uh, uh, quotes here, not to be mentioned. Uh, it, uh, viewed as square, scare uh, quotes, but as uh, indication that treatment can be a lot of uh, different things. And so the typical uh, example that is uh, that I find uh, easiest to, to think about uh, when introducing this model is if you think about a doctor uh, like Ken, who uh, sits in his, uh, in his office with a patient, and, uh, and the patient has a high blood pressure. And then you think about, well, I can give this patient a drug or I can decide not to give this uh, patient a drug. Typically you would not give a patient a placebo, I guess, if it's not a, a study, but uh, you, you could. And so then, then conceptually you can, can think of, well, if this patient would take the drug, they would have some kind of blood pressure, uh, Y1. Uh, say like uh, uh, 
140 or something. I think that's a number that uh, is relevant for blood pressure. And then uh, if, if you would give them a placebo, they might have a different um, uh, blood pressure, say like 160 or so. And, uh, and so the treatment effect for this particular uh, patient would then be the 140 minus the 160, so it would be a decrease in blood pressure of 20. So that would be the treatment effect for this person. Um, and like I said, uh, I put treatment between quotes because uh, uh, especially economists have become like really creative in thinking of what a treatment is. So for example, a year of education and a, could be a treatment or a, a treatment uh, could be uh, a, a policy change or uh, things like that. Um, now, if you look at this example, we only observe the patient in one of these situations. Eventually, we're going to give them the drug or not. So uh, that means that um, we cannot in identify the individual level treatment effect without additional assumptions. For example, uh, that uh, the, their blood pressure would be, once you give them the drug, that if you hadn't given them, the blood pressure would stay the same, but you don't know that. Um, and uh, so that means um, that uh, in general, we're, you're the, what you're estimating in, uh, in, a, in a research study is uh, something like an average treatment effect for the whole population or the average treatment effect on the treated, which is basically the average, but only for the people who were actually uh, treated. And, and all of this uh, also in principle, allows for the treatment effect to be different for different people. Now, the other uh, uh, like common uh, theoretical framework for thinking about causality is directed acyclic uh, graphs or DAGs, uh, like Lindsay already uh, showed you some of them. These are popular in behavioral sciences and, uh, and public health. Um, and in, in, these, uh, in this framework, assumptions about causal relations are depicted as, as arrows between uh, variables. And this is most natural if you have a mo model uh, in mind that involves the causal relations between multiple variables. And so I made something up here where, uh, where there's genetics and childhood socioeconomic status. And, uh, they have an effect on uh, on education, and education has an effect on midlife income. But there is no direct effect from genetics to midlife income, only through education. Uh, whether this is a sensible model, I don't know, but this might be by might be a model. And uh, so you see that, like with with a number of variables, this kind of depicts what what you how you're thinking about how these variables all uh, cost each other and are interrelated. Uh, um, so mathematically, uh, DAGs and, and the associated calculus of how to uh, um, think about uh, causality in DAGs, uh, uh, they're equivalent to the Rubin causal model on the previous slide. So while in some contexts this is more natural, in other contexts the Rubin causal model is more natural way to think about causality, like mathematically, there is no difference uh, between them. Um, so then we get to the question of how we, how can we answer uh, causal questions? Um, so the first, like the quote, correlation is not causality. I think everybody has heard that uh, before. Uh, there are many examples where, where relations are, are partially or largely uh, due to common uh, causes uh, called confounders. Um, the strongest evidence for, for causality is if the researcher can manipulate the, uh, the supposed cause variable. And, uh, and so the, the, the typical one is, uh, is the randomized control trial where you have for example, in the, uh, with, with, with the drug uh, that we mentioned, then you randomize some people into getting the drug, others into getting the placebo. Um, now, when we look at the HRS family data that we're working with and the HCAP uh, subset of that, these are observational survey data. So uh, 
There is no manipulation uh, in them, uh, let alone RCTs. So uh, there doesn't seem to be much scope for, for that uh, here, but it's always good as a, as a kind of reference uh, case to think about that. And uh, it's often uh, or sometimes useful to try to find like as if randomized assignments or as good as randomized assignments of the cause variable. And so when you think about like a randomized control trial and then see whether there is something in the data or in the context um, that would act in, the, in a similar way. So there's some examples of, of randomization in, in real life. Uh, so there's some, some actual randomization in Vietnam lottery by uh, Josh Angris is a very famous one where uh, uh, people who might need to go to, to, uh, to Vietnam uh, to fight in the war, um, they, uh, they were like their birthday within the year. So where was given a number one through 365 and that was randomized and people with a lower number were more likely to actually be sent to Vietnam than people with a higher number. Um, there was the uh, Oregon Medicaid expansion uh, about, I'd say about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Kate Baker, Amy Finkelstein uh, uh, jumped on that where uh, uh, Oregon had some, some, some money to uh, enroll some people in, into their Medicaid, uh, so health insurance for poor people, um, but, uh, but not everyone who would like, satisfy the criteria, they didn't have enough money for that. And so they actually like randomly drew some people into that, has led to a bunch of uh, uh, important papers. Uh, charter schools are often uh, used, they're often oversubscribed and so, uh, so uh, the students are like then randomized into whether they can enroll or not. Um, so my colleague Ari Kaptein, he has actually looked at, at actual lottery winners. So people who part participated in the lottery and their neighbors who also participated and won one the lottery and the others didn't um, and compare, compare those. There are some things uh, also as if randomization. So there are some examples where uh, so you have a family and they're they're having a child and whether it's a boy or a girl uh, affects later outcomes and so that's uh, considered a, a random event uh, although you have to be a little bit careful with this because in in some countries there is like sex specific uh, abortion and things like that uh, um, and there is uh, other genetics as well there is lots of twin studies where you where you combine uh, like uh, uh, monozygotic twins with dizygotic twins. I hope I say that uh, correctly. Um, and uh, so what you know from, from like how genetics works, that, uh, that tells you something about uh, uh, this. Um, and there are probably few opportunities for this kind of uh, randomization in, uh, in the HRS family. So as you have, come to realize by now I'm the party pooper telling that uh, everything is impossible. Um, so, so here is another uh, way uh, to, to establish uh, causality, uh, regression discontinuity. So government programs and policies uh, uh, and policies of other organizations uh, like hospitals or schools, et cetera, um, they often define eligibility for something, uh, say like money or uh, help or uh, enrollment in something by some kind of threshold or cutoff of a variable or, or score. So for Medicaid, I mentioned already, um, uh, under the, the recent uh, or not so recent anymore, uh, expansion of Medicaid, uh, the, the cutoff is 138% of the federal uh, poverty level. So if your income is below that, you're eligible. Above that, you're not eligible. Uh, the legal drinking age, uh, below age 21, you're not allowed to drink. Uh, once you turn 21, uh, alcohol, of course, you're allowed to drink water at any age. Um, um, once you turn 21, you're allowed to drink alcohol. Um, 
low birth weight uh, is the, in uh, uh, hospitals typically have some kind of a, a policy that if a baby is born with a weight uh, less than a certain uh, amount uh, C and uh, apparently this cutoff varies between hospitals but uh, if it's below that, then they get uh, more treatment or they're in, put in intensive care or something. Uh, and above that, they're not. Um, in educa educational context, uh, you might be eligible for, for uh, so certain courses. Uh, if, you're, uh, if your um, grades are high enough, uh, you might be accepted into college. If your uh, uh, test score is, uh, is high enough and below that test score, you're not. Now, if potential confounders do not change discreetly at the same threshold, um, and the individual cannot precisely manipulate their score, then uh, those just above the threshold and those just below the threshold are comparable. And so the eligibility then becomes as good as randomized within a narrow band. So that's a really powerful uh, result. And that uh, that uh, can allow you to get some causal results within that narrow band. Um, so the downside is that regression discontinuity often requires administrative data. You need to, to get the exact score that the government or other uh, institution uses, uh, for example, for how, how to compute income for Medicaid eligibility. There's all kinds of rules like this counts, this doesn't count. Uh, and uh, so in the survey, they might even like give you a rounded number or it might be for not exactly the same period or something. Uh, and so that messes up uh, like the, uh, the allocation of whether you're exactly above or below that uh, threshold. Um, but there are some examples that, that uh, might work in, in the uh, HRS family data. And so these are uh, uh, often, so age and date of birth are, are the ones that typically work best. And here I listed two examples. One is that um, there are these compulsory schooling laws. And let's say that like, if you were born like, after a certain date, then you have to uh, spend a, a year more in, uh, in school. Then, if you're uh, born below that um, or before that uh, date, uh, and so that that's been used, uh, for example, to look at the effect of schooling on late life uh, cognition, um, Medicare eligibility. So Medicare is uh, is uh, health insurance for uh, for older people in the in the U.S. And most people become eligible uh, for that at, the, at their 65th uh, birthday. And, uh, and so this is a, is a, a famous paper uh, by David Card and his co-authors. And this is how an, an, uh, such a regression discontinuity analysis then works. So here you have the probability to die from a heart attack. Uh, so if you have a heart attack, um, and so that goes up uh, as you age, um, but at, at age 65, there is a drop. And that drop means that like, oh, people who are now suddenly eligible for, uh, for Medicare, they get better care and therefore their probability to die uh, 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 decreases and therefore Medicare saves lives. And this is the treatment effect for people in that narrow age band. Um, so difference in differences is another uh, popular way to, uh, to study uh, causality. And this is especially common to, to estimate the effects of, of policy changes. And the basic idea is that you have some kind of outcome that you're interested in. And there is a policy change and then the outcome changes. And uh, so the, uh, the hypothesis is then, or the underlying presumption is that uh, if it weren't for this policy change, uh, the outcome would stay the same. And so here the treatment effect is the difference between those uh, two, two lines. And uh, because this uh, counterfactual is the same as what it was before, you would just compare uh, after and before. And that, and that is your treatment effect. 
Um, so that's the basic idea, but there is a lots of problems with the, with the basic idea and with simple before after comparisons, because many outcomes, uh, they uh, constantly vary uh, over time uh, due to uh, other reasons than this particular policy change. There might be other policy changes, there might be trends, there might be a business cycle, or there might just be random variation. Um, and we often do not have measurements of, of an outcome at every like continuous time points. We, in the worst case, we only have a one before point and one after point. And so if you do a before after comparison with, with, with those, you may actually be estimating the, the uh, difference, uh, these other differences and not the causal effect of the policy change that you're interested in. And so what diff and diff does is it finds a control group that is not affected by the policy change, but that is subject to the same other sources of variation as the treatment effect. So they're also subject to the trend and the, um, and the business cycle and stuff, but not to, to this particular policy change. And that might be uh, people in a different state, or uh, it might be uh, in a different subpopulation of the same uh, population, um, or even a different country. And here, here you see what the, uh, what the idea is. So there is a lot of like random variation and, and non-random variation here in the data. But you see that before the policy change, these two curves move in parallel. So the difference between them is the same. And after, it's also the same, but the difference is smaller here after the policy change than it was before. And so what difference in difference does is it compares this difference with uh, that difference or this difference um, and say, well, well, so this difference has reduced a lot and that's the, the treatment effect, the reduction in the difference. Now for diff and diff, so the important assumption that in the, the absence of the policy change, these two groups would indeed move in parallel. So that is the critical assumption. Um, if there are other policy changes between the before time point and the after time point that you happen to have, then you estimate the combined effect of all those uh, policy changes and not just the one that you're, you happen to be interested in. Um, in, the, in the core uh, HRS family data, there, uh, there may be opportunities for different diff analyses. Uh, but you need at least two waves and a policy change between them. So with the with the age cap data, this this is not feasible yet on the, until we get uh, like enough data with um, with multiple waves, uh, and we're working on that. Um, so instrumental variables is a, is a way uh, to estimate causal effects that is very popular in economics. It's uh, not much not much used in, in in other fields, and it's one of the few methods that can be widely used with uh, with observational data. Um, so the instrument or instrumental variable or IV is a variable that affects the treatment variable. So the thing that you want to cause. Uh, uh, that is the cause in your causal model, but it's uncorrelated with the error term in the model for the outcome. And what this means is there is no other way that this instrumental variable affects the outcome than through the treatment. And so this would be the, the DAG that uh, goes with that. Um, you have the instrument, the instrument affects the treatment and the treatment affects the outcome, but the in, there is no error from the instrument to the outcome. Uh, and it's in a kind of implicit here that the instrument is also not correlated with uh, the error term here. And you can add covariates to, to this uh, model. Um, and a particularly convincing uh, instrumental variable is the intended treatment in a randomized control uh, trial with imperfect compliance. So you, you assign somebody to, uh, to receive a treatment and then they si decide whether they actually uh, um, uh, do that, like take the treatment or not. Um, and so 
the only way that the assignment could actually affect the outcome is through actually taking up the uh, the treatment. And that's that's typically considered a very uh, very strong uh, one. Um, finding uh, instrumental variables in observational data. So it's often difficult uh, and you can get uh, inspiration from, from looking at examples uh, of similar analyses in the literature. So if you study the economic literature, economists have become like extremely uh, creative in thinking of, of what, uh, what an instrument is. Um, and other economists have been like very creative in thinking about why the previous economists were wrong about that. So, uh, um, so that is, I see Dave like really nodding. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like, so if, if you think, if you have something like this in mind, and so, so you, you look at what's common in your, in your field or with similar kinds of uh, analyses. Um, and lastly, unconfoundedness, and this is probably what you're going to do the most uh, this week, and what uh, uh, economists find uh, the least uh, convincing uh, also. Um, and this is that you uh, uh, simply include all potential confounders as covariates in, in your regression model. So you assume that the treatment affects the outcome, and you have a bunch of confounders that are correlated with the treatment and they also affect the outcome. And therefore you just include all of them in your model. Um, uh, alternatively, you can also think of these confounders as uh, um, affecting the selection into treatment. Um, so the key model then would be uh, the model where the confounders affect the treatment. Um, and you can then use that to adjust your main analyses and propensity score matching would be an example of that. Um, so this is traditionally the most common uh, way to, uh, to estimate uh, causal models, uh, but there have been some, some spectacular uh, failings uh, of these. And, and that's why uh, economists specifically like uh, view any kind of uh, causal claim uh, from, from uh, just regression models from, on observational data um, very skeptically, uh, but in your field, it might still be uh, okay to do that. Um, now, in my opinion, uh, the uh, so, such models, or at least the causal claims of the models become more convincing if the individual is less able to affect the treatment um so so in economics there is a there's been a lot of study of of uh, job training programs and then individuals can decide whether to uh to uh enroll in the job training or not and uh and so uh regression models that model that uh, have have turned out to be like really bad they estimate like big effects of the job training and then the, they did a randomized trial and it turned Turn out to be that there wasn't a big effect. Um, uh, but if you are less able to affect the treatment, that, that basically reduces the, the way the confounders or potential confounders uh, that you may or may not have observed could affect uh, selection into treatment. Now, common uh, confounders are components of socioeconomic status and general health and cognitive ability. Um, so the, those are ones you, you always want to think of, like what could affect the, the outcome. Okay, some, uh, some guidelines here uh, at the end, uh, inspired by uh, Lindsay's table of, uh, of the guidelines. Um, so the starting point would be to follow the literature in your field. So if everybody in your field does something, then like the, basically the starting point would be to do, do the same thing. Uh, unless you think you have an, uh, a novel method to identify causal effect, that would be uh, an innovation that always good as well, of course. Um, be honest about what you can and cannot conclude uh, from your analyses. Uh, if you 
claim causality then be explicit about what you uh, what your assumptions are that uh, uh, make you claim uh, think you claim uh, causality um, and avoid a suggestive or causal language if the analysis don't support it and use natural uh, neutral uh, language instead so you would say association if you cannot claim causality um, Speculation about causality is allowed, at least by me, uh, in the in the motivation or introduction of a paper uh, and in the discussion section. If you have done the results and you say, well, we find this association, then I think it's totally fine in the discussion to speculate about whether that's a causal effect or not and, and, uh, and uh, why it might or might not be. Uh, but you have to like, properly word uh, your assumptions. Uh, and of course, do what Emily, Lindsay, and Alden say. That's uh, the most important. Since I'm always the, the party pooper, like you, you should like put uh, my words other than this one. Uh, give that less weight. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Emily. Yeah. How do you show that there's no way where people are comparable? Yeah, so there are uh, there are rules and algorithms for that, and they uh, they uh, are based on like super complicated uh, mathematics and statistics. Basically, it's a bias variance trade off, and so there are there are there are ways to estimate the bias and the and the variance, and um, it involves uh, it becomes a function of sample size and stuff, and it's uh, it's pretty complicated. And so uh, the the best advice is like there are state of programs that do that for you, and so <laughs> use those. That's uh, that's what I do. Uh, okay. So the question was how you uh, uh, select the narrow band uh, for in in a regression uh, discontinuity. So why is proposition for matching? Should I see um, causality or should I limit it? Like um, so, okay, can you repeat the first uh, part? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, should I? I have, yeah, I always get a little bit confused. Should I see uh, causality or discount and causality or should I limit it? Yeah. Um, so the question is whether uh, if, if you use propensity score matching, whether uh, you should assume causality. Well, that dep depends on whether you're convinced that you've, uh, you've included all potential confounders, right? Uh, so, uh, so that depends on, on your assumption and, uh, and whether your re referees believe you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, if you if you don't believe that it has any effect on how good you estimate a causal effect, then there's no point in doing a propensity score matching, right? So you always have in mind that it at least gets you closer to a causal effect. So, so I think you cannot uh, avoid like taking some stand on that uh, in your paper if you use that. Uh, you speculate about causality, but you're saying that it's causal. Yeah, just, you, you put it as a limitation in there. Okay. <laughs> and it's different to say it's psychoeconomics, unlike the people on the score matching, convince them, right? That you can speculate on other disciplines and other people. Yeah, so the, uh, the token economist in, uh, in the room says, like, economists don't find it uh, convincing, but other fields. Uh, they may, yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll close the webinar and then I'll give them my two. Yes. All right. So, my digital webinar, so I'm definitely on Friday.